Welcome to Room 101 at Harrigan Compound West. It's story time. So this week, the, the mailman came and he brought a bunch of Cornell and Deal from Beyond, which was the, um, the small batch release that just got put out. I couldn't have been more than a week ago. I placed an order with SmokingPipes.com, as I often do. Matter of fact, I spend so much money there that I think they should really be sponsoring this event that, that we're doing right now. Alas, we're going to have to get more visitors before that happens. But in the meantime, we can talk about the From Beyond. It, they made 2,500 tins at two ounces apiece, which puts it at roughly 312 pounds worth of From Beyond. And it was um, patterned on a, uh, on a 1980s tin of Dunhill Nightcap. The earliest I had it was in the late 90s, and I, I've loved it from then to now through the Peterson uh, editions, but I really don't have much of an idea of what it tasted like back in the 80s, so we're going to think about From Beyond on its own merits, not as a, a com comparable to, to Nightcap. And I've been puffing away at it for a while now today, and it, it was a little milder than I thought it was going to be. It's got a, a pretty interesting blend. You can You can see that right here somewhere. When you think nightcap, you, you probably think Latakia, but you're wrong to do so in this case. Although there is Latakia in here, and there's some Perique as well, a um, couple of Virginias and a couple of Orientals. And it's the Orientals, I think, that get pushed to the front uh, on the taste profile, which is just fine by me. Um, it's milder, much milder than I would have thought it would be. And yet, it's interesting. It, it's got, um, for lack of a better word, an adult taste profile to it. And if you, you grab yourself some, if it's even possible to get any anymore, you'll, you'll see what I mean straight away. Anyway, that's all well and good, but I want to bring us back to 2014, some years back. And it was in 2014 that I left the, uh, the home in western Pennsylvania and drove out to Utah. This would be the second time I moved to Utah. First time was 1999, and I stayed for two years that first time. And it must have been like the pain of childbirth, right? Because somehow I managed to forget all the reasons why I hated Utah the first time. And like an idiot, I packed up the car and I drove right back out there. And I, I moved in, and, and of course, getting into town, I needed to find some place to live. And that meant an apartment, not a house. It's a two-bedroom, two-story apartment for $425 a month, which in this town, Logan, Utah, was actually quite expensive. Be that as it may, I, I moved in, and as luck would have it, I didn't really have anything to move in with. I had a living room that contained only a very small amplifier and a single guitar. I had a kitchen that contained only a folding chair and a borrowed table. And upstairs in the two bedrooms, I had one inflatable mattress. So I was living pretty close to the bone when I was there. And you get to the point, right, where no matter what you do, there's really not a lot to do with your environment because it's uncomfortable and there's not much there. So I found myself staying at work till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I didn't really have to be there at any specific time, so I'd roll out of bed at 10 or 11 or even noon head on in and develop a bit of a pattern. And the pattern got upset when one day I had to get home for some stupid reason. Can't even remember why. And I was sitting in daylight hours at the uh, the borrowed table in my, my folding chair. And I had a, a, a gigantic sliding glass door off to my right. And beyond that, there was a, a patio, some grass, and a thicket. The thicket was pretty thick, actually, and it, it led out to a stream on the other side. And uh, I was sitting there, and a duck pokes her way through the thicket and stands there staring at me at, at roughly the length of my patio. And uh, this amused me till no end, because I didn't have a television. you, you got to do something. And I named that duck Rufus. It seemed wise at the time. And Rufus stood there watching me and, and then turned around and went away. And I thought, well, that was nice. About 15, 20 minutes later, Rufus came through the thicket again, same place, with four babies, four little Rufuses. 
I was kind of married to the name Rufus by this point, so we kept it. And they came all the way up to the door. Um, Rufus had apparently checked me out, made sure I wasn't going to be a threat of some kind, and then she brought her babies over to meet me too. And, you know, being the bored man that I was, I found some bread in the kitchen and I gave it to the Rufuses. And then I read up on things and I know I've, I learned you're never to give bread to ducks. Apparently it causes all kinds of digestive distress for them. So they came back the next day, actually, and I gave them bread again because, you know, it's not like I acted on this information or anything. But after they came by the second day, I went to the, to the grocery store and I bought some frozen peas and some frozen corn, figuring if they don't like it, I, I will. And um, they came back the next day and I heated them up, their food up in the microwave for them. Cold vegetables, really not nice. So I gave it to them, and, and they loved it. And to come to find out, they were even coming up pretty close to my hand. Well, fast forward a couple of weeks, and they come by every single day. And as time goes by, more and more ducks come. And before you know it, there's a whole brood of ducks that are coming and going with tremendous regularity. They got so brazen that they would actually, if I opened the door, come up and stick their heads in the door, this close to coming in. And uh, the more they came, the happier I got. So I started luring them in a little bit. I would hold the food out, and they would jump in and eat the food and then run, out, run away. And after they realized that this wasn't going to be a problem, I would just sit cross-legged on the floor, and I'd, I'd kind of hand out the food. And before you know it, the, the four Rufuses turned into a flock of ducks. I don't think ducks come in flocks, but that's what it looked like at the time. And it got so bad, so ridiculous, that I would come home from work, I would slide the door open, and I would say, I'm home, and all these ducks would descend upon me. And it got to the point where there were 50, maybe even 60 ducks, and that, that's ridiculous. It's, as, it's every bit as ridiculous as it sounds. But imagine that they're all in your kitchen. I would just sit there and they would crawl all over me. I became known as the duck whisperer because apparently I could have conversations with them and they could understand. And I learned that ducks are trainable to some degree. That's how they keep coming over to the house, right? And it got so bad that I would come home from work and there'd be 50 or 60 of them on just the back patio pooping all over the place. And yet when they came inside, they rarely pooped in, in the apartment, which was for the best because, you know, security deposit. Anyway, it got to be time for me to move out. And it's a little, a little bittersweet because I'm, I'm moving into a really nice house one town down the road, and I have to leave all the ducks behind. There's no natural water up near where the ducks could live in. You just couldn't do it. So I had to leave them behind. And the last day, my landlord came over and he looked around and he said, this place looks exactly like it did the day you moved in. And it did. There was just nothing in the place the day I moved out. I moved out in one trip in a two-door sports car. But I said, you got to see this. Probably shouldn't be showing you this. Probably going to have a problem with this, but I got to show you. And I opened the sliding glass door and I, I hung my head out and I said, I'm home. And within 30 seconds, the kitchen was filled with about 45 ducks. And the landlord looked at me, and I thought, there goes my security deposit. And he, instead of, of arguing with me, he looked at me and said, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen. And I thought, yes, it absolutely is the coolest thing you've ever seen. And I handed him a bowl full of warm, not hot, but warm peas and corn. I said, they like this. And... Uh, he started putting it in his hand and holding it down, and I, I got him to sit down on the floor, and the ducks just kind of wandered between us for a while. And he shook his head, and, and I'll remember this until the day I die. He said, you are the weirdest Ronin I have ever known, which I took to, me, to be one hell of a compliment. Anyway, I moved out, and I never did see my ducks again. Unfortunately, I then moved to Arizona, which is an inhospitable climate for ducks. There is a pool here out back. And I got very excited for about 12 seconds one day, thinking I could spring ducks and put them in the pool and everything will be fine. Um, then I, I read about what happens to ducks when they sit in chlorinated water and figured it's probably best if we didn't have ducks in the pool. And there it is. 
my life with the ducks. It, it kept me quite sane for uh, seven, eight, nine months or so. That second trip through Utah, a trip I probably shouldn't have made, but did anyway. So what are we going to say about this? I'm about two-thirds of the way through this ball. And i got to say, it gets better at the end. It was pretty good to begin. It's better now. Although it's not that flavor profile that just blows you right over. It, it's going to take a minute to appreciate this. I like it. I don't think I love it. I'm interested to see what it feels like in three, four, five months, maybe a year. I don't know if we'll keep it around that long. I don't know if it's that good. It's certainly not one of the essential tobaccos. But I am hoping that it becomes so. I guess I'll give this one a B plus, maybe. That seems a little generous, maybe a B. Not bad, not great. I wouldn't reach for it regularly. But I don't mind it that, that I've got it in the bowl right now. So who knows what happens down the road. H-A-R-R-I-G-A-N spells Harrigan. Proud of all the Irish blood that's in me. So Here the man can say you find out ducks are really quite smart. You can train them. Um, it, duck politics emerge when you're among 50, 60 ducks. You start to see, dare I say it, the pecking order. Um might be why we call it that. I always thought that was a chicken kind of thing. But I have to question their intelligence because they, they loved peas and they loved corn. But one day I was feeling exceptionally generous and I made them a bowl full of mac and cheese and I put it out in the middle of the kitchen floor and one by one, 20 ducks came up to that bowl, looked at it, turned around and walked away. So I don't know how smart we can contend the ducks are if they don't like mac and cheese. Still, see you next week.